Cities are complex machines, not just in terms of technology and infrastructure, but in terms of social engineering. A city like New York, where there's 8 million people, how do you manage such a large population? What is the best way of organizing society in a way that makes sense? Well, economically, there is currently two conflicting ideologies, capitalism and socialism. So as someone who loves cities and make videos about them, I thought I'd create an episode where I cover what is the best method for managing a city, capitalism or socialism. Let's take a look at the strength and weaknesses of each. Capitalism and socialism have become such loaded terms that the best starting point for this video is to describe what they are without prejudice. Capitalism is an economic system where production is managed privately by individuals. Socialism is an economic system where production is managed collectively by the state. You see, their definition also outlined their major differences. In one system, production is managed by individuals, privately of course. In the other system, production is managed by the state. It's not that one is good and the other evil. Neither capitalism or socialism is inherently good or evil. They're simply different ways of organizing society. It's not a matter of capitalism or socialism. Both systems are susceptible to hijacking. What it really comes down to is a matter of morality. In a perfectly moral society, either capitalism or socialism would work just fine. Since we are morally imperfect, however, we have to pick a system where errors are not centralized, basically keeping errors local. We also have to pick a system where information and feedback is very rapid so that discrepancies can be fixed. Let's see which economic system is the best for doing that. In capitalism, production is left at the hands of private individuals. These individuals are typically called entrepreneurs. Each entrepreneur will produce different goods and services. However, they will also experiment with different management techniques. And that is important because when a management technique fails, that error is kept local at the level of the entrepreneur who applied it. Another side effect of keeping errors local is that the entrepreneur who failed will most likely share his sorrows and mistakes to other entrepreneurs. This way the market learns and errors are not repeated. In socialism, production is managed by the state. Now the state may experiment with different management techniques and it often does. However, if that experimentation fails, the whole municipality, city or country will suffer the consequences. This is the concept of centralizing errors, which is what socialism does inadvertently. In capitalism, there are two systems that give entrepreneurs really rapid feedback when he or she is trying to produce wealth. These two feedback mechanisms are demand and price. Demand gives the entrepreneur an idea of how much people desire his or her goods or services. Price, on the other hand, more importantly, I should say cost. Cost gives the entrepreneur an idea how much energy it takes to produce that good or service that is in demand. If the entrepreneur can manage to produce that good at a cost that is lower than what people are willing to pay for it, then a whole array of calculus is accounted for and this entrepreneur is properly managing resources. In socialism, the two feedback mechanisms the state uses to manage production are votes and collected statistics. Now with votes, as an input mechanism, although they allow the individual to voice his or her opinion, the problem with them is that they are far too partial. If a legislation passes by 60%, that means that 40% of people did not get what they want. As a feedback mechanism, although statistics allow the government to measure output, their biggest drawback is the fact that there is an assumption that the metrics they are tracking are the correct ones, and that could be completely incorrect. In fact, the state could start with a false premise, and in that case, it would be measuring or tracking the wrong metrics while ignoring the appropriate metrics. And this drawback is a simple side effect 
of the fact that in socialism, there isn't an honest price mechanism. Things are never free. By saying things are free, the state is simply being dishonest. Because what is really occurring is that someone else on the back end that you don't see is paying the cost. This so-called free or dishonest price mechanism inhibits the calculus to assess whether resources are being properly managed. And this is the biggest drawback of socialism, the lack of honest pricing. Now, capitalism also has its own weaknesses. This is because talent, ability, drive, and knowledge varies across individuals. And this difference is bound to reflect in an economic domain. Wealth disparities are a natural side effect of capitalist system. And us, as a collective, have two ways of dealing with it, collectively or individually. In a morally perfect world, we would not need public welfare. Individuals would take care of each other privately. But since we are morally imperfect, we probably need a state to provide collective welfare for the economically disadvantaged and also protect individuals from corporate tyranny. This is why I believe a mixture of capitalism and socialism is probably the best. These two represent opposite forces of nature that should balance each other out rather than completely dominate one another. That's it for this episode. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want more student information. And of course, don't forget to download the CityScape app if you want to find secret spots in your city. Now, before you go, make sure you put your thoughts in the comment section. Which way do you think is the best way to organize a city? Capitalism or socialism? That's it for this episode, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.